Hello, everyone. Welcome to Diversity in Florida Preservation. I'm Adrian Burke, Principal Planner with Miami-Dade County's Office of Historic Preservation. While we wish we were here with you in Miami, we're delighted today to share some of the exciting preservation efforts going on around the state of Florida. Historically, the land we refer to today as the Miami area is on the traditional homelands and territories of the Tequesta, their ancestors, and the Seminole. The state is home to the Seminole Miccosukee, Muscogee and Choctaw, and to individuals of many other Native groups. We acknowledge the historical and continuing impacts of colonization on Indigenous communities, and we will continue to work to be more accountable to the needs and history of Indigenous peoples. We encourage all attendees of Pass Forward to learn more about the Indigenous people in your community and their way of life. Again, welcome. Today's agenda consists of short presentations from our guest speakers. The session is intended to get you thinking about diversity in historic preservation in a couple of ways, using Florida stories as an example. One is to be more inclusive of the stories we tell and the histories and sites we seek to preserve and promote. We can and should all work together to tell a more diverse and inclusive narrative through our work in historic preservation. The other way is to think about historic preservation itself in a more diverse way. Preservation is increasingly moving beyond the building. How can we think about preservation as more than just architecture? Today's speakers represent academia, nonprofits, archaeology, and government. They will share examples of the above through their work in storytelling, working with communities, highlighting diverse history, shifting organizations internally, and ways to think differently about local government preservation. I'll introduce each speaker before we get started, and I, or before they get started, I should say, and I'm happy to introduce our first speaker, Reverend Houston R. Cypress. Reverend Houston R. Cypress, he, they, is a two-spirit poet, artist, filmmaker, and environmentalist from the Otter Clan of the Miccosukee Tribe. Art, conflict management, facilitation, multimedia communications, gender diversity, and spirituality are priorities he contributes via local, regional, and international organizations. He invites you to join him in creating portals between worlds. Welcome, Reverend Cyprus. Thank you, Adrian, and thank you, friends here at the conference. It's really uh, an honor to be with you here and to share um, some of my perspectives and some of the work that I've been doing um, out here in South Florida, in the watershed that's known as the Greater Everglades. And just to say just a little briefly a bit more about myself, I happen to have a nonprofit that I um, operate with my colleagues. It's known as Love the Everglades Movement. And I also serve my community, the Miccosukee Tribe, as a member of their Environmental Advisory Committee. Um, aside from that, some of the other things that I appreciate are the arts. I have an artistic practice. Um, but I think that my artistic practice and my spiritual practice kind of embraces all the things that we're going to talk about today. And another one of my priorities in my work is gender diversity. So um, I wanted to talk briefly about how environmental conservation work can support and can be considered as um, historic preservation in a way and how this is based to how this is linked to the land-based learning that we're conducting out here as indigenous folks in South Florida. And this is from my perspective as a member of the Miccosukee tribe and a member of the Otter family. So uh, I hope that you all know that you're always welcome to come and visit me here in South Florida whenever you're ready. But I wanted to begin by talking about the sanctity and the sacredness of the landscape. Um, it's the perspective and practice of respecting the entire landscape as a sacred site. It's not just a parcel that has been delineated or delimited. One cannot just say that, oh, the area within this border is sacred and everything else can be desecrated. No, it's that the totality of the landscape is alive. The totality of the landscape has dignity, especially in its integrity as a functioning ecosystem. It has resilience. So when we support the cycles of nature, we see the incredible bounce back of the species and the biodiversity. But the sacredness is also added to because of our own human activities on the land, because we have these places as historical um, sites for historical events, whether those are the conflicts that we fought or the peace that we have made or the ancestors that we have buried. Maybe we're looking into things archeologically Maybe we're celebrating our religious or spiritual events or gardening or even collecting plant medicines. These are some of the sacred activities that imbue the landscape with this special feeling and special appreciation. 
And down here in South Florida and across the peninsula, we're in engaged in a massive restoration project. And it so happens that the Everglades restoration process is threatening some of our sacred sites. Um, throughout the greater Everglades, we're talking about an area that spans from central Florida all the way down to Florida Bay and Biscayne Bay. This restoration project is um, reconfiguring the land, um, trying to put things back, improve water quality, and also provide for our own activities as people and protecting plants and animals, our friends, the plants and animals. But when we look at some of these restoration projects, um, these are threatening sites that the indigenous communities respect highly, like the Mikasuki, people like the Seminole. And there's one project in particular that's referred to as the EAA Reservoir, the Everglades Agricultural Area Reservoir, because there happens to be a um, site of cultural concern, what we mean is a burial site that is smack dab in the middle of the proposed project site. So you can see how we have to be very um, careful in what we're doing and also um, navigate and coordinate with other jurisdictions and other sovereignties like the indigenous communities. And this goes back to a that reconciliation is vital to improving knowledge. Since 2009, we happen to be in an American context of reconciliation. That's when the United States actually apologized to the native peoples for the troubled and um, um, the troubled history that we have endured as people um, on this land, on Turtle Island. What we need to do is strengthen our relationships with our indigenous neighbors, our indigenous hosts, and work together on these important issues. Because among the decision makers in my community, people like the elders, the voters, and the elected officials, there's a legacy of historical trauma caused by colonization and policies that is manifesting today as a distrust of state and federal governments. But there's a positive side to this because this kind of historical trauma can also lead to innovations. And that's what our indigenous communities are doing, especially in the realms of the sciences, especially in governance and the arts. For example, in my own Miccosukee community, we have our own version of the EPA, um, the Environmental Protection Agency. We have the Miccosukee EPA, and they happen to be leaders in the Everglades sciences and the scientific knowledge that we're producing is definitely contributing to the kind of preservation work that we're doing here on the land itself because knowledge is embedded in the land. But how do we access that knowledge? Well, there's a couple of different techniques that we can use, a couple of different tools and analysis that we can deploy. Um, on a personal and spiritual level, we can talk about deep listening and intuition um, on a cultural level, we can talk about the transmission of traditional ecological knowledge, stories and legends and spiritual practices. But in a broader contemporary sense, we can also definitely use tools and analysis. And we're being taught by the land itself and by the many species that the land embraces. But the land is being threatened by so many of the negative outputs of our activities like agriculture, generating electricity, tourism, commerce, and even war. So that's why I'm talking about reconciliation here, because this brings up environmental justice concerns. And that's one of the direct criticisms that Miccosukee folks have about the restoration process. So that talks about the strategies that we need to overcome political challenges, because many communities across the United States, we're negotiating this pol polarized political landscape. Um, things like critical race theory and other perspectives are being demonized. And this is stifling the kind of critical and deep conversations that we have to have as community communities. And it also limits the kinds of activities that we can engage in. Like what I mean is, how am I gonna help people understand environmental racism that my community is suffering from if we can't even talk about this in our public institutions? Meanwhile, as all this is happening, um, within our own people communities, here in the Everglades, we are losing the Everglades tree islands. We're tracking the loss, the acreage of loss, um, because of the mismanagement of water levels. And think about it this way, when the, this, when the tree islands of the Everglades are dissolving, this is um, the same thing as the crumbling of a cathedral, a place of worship, a place where knowledge is um, embedded in the architecture of the natural growth of the trees, 
um, the plants that heal our communities. And so much of this um, traditional ecological knowledge is embedded, for example, in our Miccosukee language. When the language is threatened, the world is threatened. And it's kind of hard to sp continue to speak our language when the world that we're describing is disappearing. So I think that an indigenous cosmovision, indigenous languages and landscapes um, are another kind of history, another kind of epistemology, another opportunity for healing and friendship and reconciliation. And I feel like these are things that ought to be embraced by the broader community of historic preservation and beyond. But friends, I want to invite you to come visit and see what we're talking about. And I hope to see you soon somewhere here deep in the greater Everglades. Thank you for your time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Reverend Cypress. That's a great challenge and a wonderful invitation. Um, I'm going to take you up on it, certainly. So thank you so much. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Brittany Brown. Dr. Brittany Brown is from Jacksonville, Florida. She received her Bachelor of Arts from the University of Florida with a major in anthropology. While attending the University of Florida, she completed her undergraduate fieldwork at Kingsley Plantation in Jacksonville. She received her Master of Arts and her PhD in anthropology from the College of William and Mary. Dr. Brown is an American historical archaeologist. Her regional areas of specialization include the African-American Southeast and the British Caribbean. Her current research interests include post-emancipation era mortuary practices among African-Americans in Jacksonville, Florida, and maritime archaeology. Welcome, Dr. Brown. Thank you all for having me. So today I want to talk to you all about preserving African-American cemeteries. So in written history, African American people often appear in legal documents like wills, um, inventory, uh, or in newspapers as fugitive runaways or targets of anti-Black violence. It's often the perspective of enslavers that get to shape the written histories of African American people. And uh, this is what makes preservation of the material culture a crucial part of understanding who Africans and their descendants were beyond what is written about them in history. And I believe that archaeology is a field that is uniquely suited for this endeavor. Um, however, the field of archaeology uh, didn't include However, the field of archaeology didn't include a history of African American heritage until 1968. So, the first African American historical site to be explored through archaeology is Kingsley Plantation, which is situated in Jacksonville, Florida. And it's named for the Kingsley occupation of 1834. And the plantation was owned and operated by Zephaniah Kingsley and his West African wife, Anna. Together, they held roughly 60 captive African people. And uh, today, the park is a national site. So everything from the building's big house to the tabby cabins that served as captive African dwellings uh, were, are perfectly preserved and you can visit them today. But I think that there's something else, uh, an archaeological feature that is also worth hiding, highlighting, and that is the Captive African Cemetery. So the Captive African uh, Cemetery is situated also on the plantation, and cemeteries in and of themselves are tangible records of history that have been created and shaped directly by Africans and their descendants. Um, and historic cemeteries encapsulate centuries of African American history and indigenous African knowledges. They are what Toni Morrison calls cultural sites of memory. They also give us data. So they also offer isotope signatures, which offer insights about African origins, birthplaces, migration patterns. Um, the bones can tell us a lot about the causes of death and the age of people at the time of their death. Um, they also offer a bevy of artifacts, um, handmade headstones, painted tombs, white and reflective objects and broken pottery, as well as biblical iconography. Um, are some of the things that we can expect to find when we walk into a cemetery. And also landscapes. 
Um, African-American communities use shells and landscape features like yucca plants and oak trees to mark burials. Um, those are some of the landscape features that are used in cemeteries commonly throughout the um, Southeast. And what we are seeing is that African Americans are using African knowledge systems to navigate, shape, and create these uh, burial spaces um, in the North American world more broadly. And that their culture that they're bringing with them from Africa into the new world is literally embedded into the landscape. Each preservation project for me, um, I believe should foreground uh, descendant community voices. They should actively involve the community from start to finish and ensure transparency, uh, which means uh, making research objectives going into the project. Um, and the data that comes out of the project accessible to community members. Practitioners have to work actively with communities if they want to preserve structures, artifacts, and sites, which also includes um, landscape features. So while there's a, a myriad of ways that we can do this, I think that perhaps one of the best ways we can do this is establishing uh, a federal policy so establishing policy um, to not only protect the spaces and burials, um, but that also outlines a code of ethics for dealing with descendant communities. Uh, one of the things that I've thought deeply about is modeling this after the Native American uh, Protection and Repatriation Act, also known as NAGPRA, that would require uh, practitioners working in African American historic uh, graveyards to consult with descendant communities as it relates to human remains and other cultural items, uh, protecting and planning for the discovery of African American human remains and other cultural items, especially if they're uh, at some point going to be removed from the site, identifying and reporting all African American human remains and other cultural items held in collections currently, and giving notice prior to uh, repatriating or transferring human remains or other cultural items. However, um, establishing policy for cemeteries uh, for African American people also means protecting the environment. Um, so the final resting place of captive Africans and African American heritage sites more broadly stretch be stretches beyond the terrestrial landscape um, and into our world's uh, oceans. And so underwater archaeology has become a new frontier for African American archaeology. And nevertheless, like terrestrial projects, these uh, maritime archaeology projects will require that we consult communities, protect our oceans, protect our landscapes, um, and preserve our material culture, but also enlist and work to enlist the next generation of cultural heritage stewards um, in order to tell our stories. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Both your presentation and Reverend Cypress's presentation um, certainly are doing what we wanted to do with this presentation, which was think about preservation beyond the typical things that we as historic preservation practitioners think about. So uh, the environment, the ocean, uh, this is really amazing. So thank you so much, Dr. Brown. With that, we will turn to our next speakers. Ennis Davis is a senior planner with Alfred Benesh and Company, a civic activist dedicated to improving communities. Ennis is also the vice president of membership services and community outreach for the Florida chapter of the American Planning Association. He is a Florida Trust for Historic Preservation trustee and chair of the Florida Trust's 11 to Save Committee, a Groundwork Jacksonville board member, author of award-winning books, Reclaiming Jacksonville, Cohen Brothers, The Big Store, and Images of Modern America, Jacksonville. He's also co-founder of online media publications, the jacksonmag.com and moderncities.com. Ted Johnson is a park ranger who has served 20 years with the National Park Service. He's currently the community engagement specialist at Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve in Jacksonville, Florida. Throughout his career, he's developed numerous African-American history and culture related projects designed to ensure that more diverse stories are included in the national history narrative. He works closely with the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission and other partners to engage culturally diverse communities throughout the Southeast, including Cosmo, a gateway community in Jacksonville that neighbors the National Park. 
He's been instrumental in numerous collaborative efforts to preserve and promote cultural heritage throughout the corridor and beyond. Tell them the story together. I'm glad to be here today. Uh, my name is Ennis Davis. And when I start my, these types of presentations off, I always like to give a little homage to my ancestors of the past because without their uh, sacrifices, I wouldn't be uh, where I'm at today to even be able to participate in this program. Uh, with that being said, I am an urban planner uh, and a sixth generation Floridian. I'm also the vice president of membership and outreach for the American Planning Association's Florida chapter and a trustee uh, for the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation. And also I happen to be a Gullah Geechee a descendant. And so this is a great presentation that I'm honored to be a part of. Uh, so you may say, you know, who are the Gullah Geechee? Well, the Gullah Geechee are basically descendants of Central and West Africans uh, that have traditionally lived along uh, the low country, the Southeastern US, basically stretching from St. Augustine, Florida to the South, to Wilmington, North Carolina to the North and about 30 miles inland. Uh, over time, because of living in isolation for a number of decades, uh, this culture has retained a significant portion of American, I mean, African American or African culture uh, that has been integrated into um, the Southeastern USA and is still pretty much uh, present within our religious institutions, our arts and crafts, architecture, music, and, and food uh, throughout. Uh, the low country area. In Northeast Florida specifically, there are a number of Gullah Geechee communities, both rural and urbanized. But for the next few minutes, we want to talk about and focus on the community of Cosmo. So Cosmo was settled around 1877 uh, by recently um, freed men and freed women. And to sustain themselves, many uh, harvested oysters from the St. John's River, as well as fished for mullet. In the second half of the 20th century, Cosmo is a community that uh, has been engulfed by suburban sprawl. And today, residents of the community are working to preserve their heritage and culture and history. So with that in mind, in 2020, the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation uh, named the community of Cosmo to its 11 to save list. And really this was a part of an effort to bring awareness and to support uh, the community's ongoing work uh, to preserve and tell its story. So with that in mind, I do want to go ahead and hand this presentation off to Ted Johnson of the National Park Service. And Ted's going to highlight uh, some of the ongoing work that has taken place in the Cosmo community. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Ennis. And so, yes, again, my name is Ted Johnson. Uh, I'm the community engagement specialist here at uh, Timaquan Ecological and Historic Preserve, so a National Park Service site here in Jacksonville. And, um, you yeah, know, we work very closely with uh, the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor Commission. So Ennis has already uh, you know, clarify basically where that corridor exists. And so uh, it is a, a national heritage area. So the commission works closely with uh, the National Park Service sites uh, along that corridor to help engage uh, with uh, these Gullah Geechee descendant communities uh, in ways that can be mutually beneficial um, to help uh, promote uh, and preserve uh, Gullah Geechee uh, culture and heritage. Uh, so, uh, as it turns out, uh, Cosmo is only about uh, a mile or two from one of the, the major sites that uh, we preserve and interpret here in the preserve, uh, Fort Caroline. Uh, so, I'm just going to showcase uh, some of the, uh, the highlights of, of the collaborations uh, that uh, have been successful uh, over the past the three years that I've been working uh, here uh, at the park and with the community. Uh, the community's um, preservation effort uh, really uh, was formally established in 2014, the Cosmo uh, Historic Preservation Association. Um, it's now known as the, the Corporation, uh, and it is a 501c3, but it was established by uh, Reverend uh, Ethel Dolores Demps, uh, whom we see pictured here, 
Uh, she was a lifelong resident uh, of Cosmos, born and raised. Um, yeah, she did pass in 2017, but uh, it was her uh, passion to uh, preserve and protect uh, the memories that she had of growing up in Cosmo. And so uh, you can see here, uh, she has in the center, there's um, a major uh, design there that I think uh, is meant to to uh, characterize what it is about the uh, the community that is um, significant in its resilience. Uh, the idea is the concept of uh, educate, develop, and preserve. Uh, the cookbook that we see here is something that the community uh, uh, continues to uh, keep in print um, as a part of their homage to uh, Reverend Demps. Um, one of her uh, major goals uh, was to establish a, a community park uh, that not only preserved the, the natural um, you know, environment so that folks could uh, experience and enjoy that and benefit from that, uh, but also preserve uh, the culture uh, and uh, the heritage and the history of the community of Cosmo. And uh, that came to fruition um, officially uh, this year, or this year. Um, it is a park that's established by the, the city of Jacksonville known as Freedom Park. Uh, so um, it, um, uh, it also, you can see that the, the layout there. Uh, it's also a park, the park is shared uh, to acknowledge veterans with PTSD. Uh, but um, the idea here uh, was uh, uh, with our work, uh, our collaboration with uh, the community and the, the commission, uh, one of the things that we did was, uh, and, and Ennis also worked uh, with this, and he has worked with uh, several, as he said, uh, several of these initiatives and, and activities um, with the community. Uh, so we established um, a team to develop uh, some signage, interpretive signage there in the park uh, that talk about not only uh, the Gullah Geechee people, but specifically the community of Cosmo. And then as you can see, um, uh, community landmarks there in Cosmo that are, are significant uh, and remain in, in uh, some form or another. Uh, one of the ideas in the future is to hopefully kind of try to establish um, a, a Cosmo historic trail that folks can visit and learn more about these uh, sites of significance through signage. And then you see there down the bottom uh, right is a, a panel dedicated to uh, Reverend Demps. Um, so the, uh, the city had an official um, ribbon cutting ded uh, kind of dedication ceremony, uh, March uh, 18th of this year. And then the, the next day, the 19th, uh, the community of Cosmo had a real throwdown. It was the Cosmo uh, Heritage Celebration. So uh, all types of performances um, relating to Gullah Geechee culture, so spoken word, um, dance performances, music uh, by the, uh, provided by the McIntosh County Shouters, and then uh, a unique uh, Jacksonville flavor uh, performance uh, was also um, included, and that was under uh, the umbrella of the uh, Jacksonville Gullah Geechee Nation uh, Community Development Corporation, another group uh, with whom we work uh, that is a, an umbrella uh, a corporation that works with several other descendant communities uh, here in Jacksonville. Uh, there is also um, working with the commission, we developed uh, a new brochure, updated the brochure for uh, the Historic Preservation Now Corporation. So they utilize that uh, when they go out to any of their um, uh, you know, outreach um, uh, you know, activities. Um, so uh, that has served very well. Uh, again, this has really been a mutually beneficial um, relationship uh, between the Park Service and, uh, and the community. So not only do we assist in uh, helping them to research uh, some of their uh, cultural heritage, especially as it uh, uh, relates to the preserve itself, um, but they are very willing uh, to share with us um, various aspects of their cultural heritage so that we can share that with a much larger kind of global audience. So earlier this year, we uh, recorded several um, oral histories with elders of the community, and those now live on the National Park Service, uh, meaning Tim McQuam Preserves website. We also uh, conducted some recordings uh, and videos uh, of uh, the spiritual music of the community. And this was conducted uh, with one of the, uh, the churches here uh, in the community. So we have about three or four songs uh, that are available to hear. Uh, also uh, have a home on our website. Uh, earlier this year, the, the park received uh, funding from the National Park Foundation to 
uh, host a, a series of um, uh, a public uh, events, family events known as uh, the Junior Ranger Angler um, events. And so uh, these events are basically meant to, uh, to provide training for um, young uh, anglers uh, to learn about ethical angling. Uh, and um, we also though incorporate uh, a, a cultural aspect. So not only do we uh, demonstrate some of the traditional indigenous Tamuqua uh, fishing uh, techniques, but the members of the community of Cosmo, where they come out and they demonstrate some of their traditional techniques. And in the center, you see uh, the, the president of the, um, the, the Cosmo Historic Preservation Corporation, Levon White, and his mother, uh, next to him, Doris. Uh, she is also the, the matriarch of the community. And uh, from my understanding, she's the, the master uh, fisher person there in the community. They have really embraced this opportunity to bring and share um, more of their culture uh, to a, a much uh, wider audience. Uh, earlier this year, we also worked with a team from uh, Auburn University. They were already researching uh, the impact uh, and influence uh, and activities of U.S. colored troops uh, here within the boundaries of the, of the preserve. Then we realized uh, we would learn more by engaging the descendant communities. So we reach out, connected with not only the folks of Cosmo, but then also nearby Lone Star. Many of the descendant communities uh, have families that uh, exist in several because they would intermarry and migrate, especially those that were in close proximity. So we learned uh, in researching the Lone Star Cemetery where we found uh, several uh, U.S. colored troop markers that uh, Levon, again, the, the president there of the Cosmo Association, uh, his and, and Doris's ancestor was not only uh, a U.S. Uh, color troops, uh, res, uh, excuse me, uh, veteran, but uh, he also was a prominent property owner who uh, would share and donate property to the established community of Lone Star, including the church itself uh, connected to this cemetery. Um, what I think has been most significant in maintaining the uh, relationship is uh, I, I make sure that I attend the community's uh, um, monthly meetings. Uh, and these uh, meetings are, are a fantastic forum for uh, the community to share, um, you know, new news and aspirations that they have for preserving their cultural heritage. And then we, uh, the Park Service and the Commission can share opportunities uh, to assist the community in doing that, again, in a mutually beneficial way. But re what, what resonates, I think, mostly with me is that at each meeting, uh, the community displays uh, material culture that uh, reinforces their uh, devotion and dedication to the ancestors uh, who are not only continually influential, but are really significant in the resilience of the community. Um, and then just recently, this past uh, Saturday, uh, we uh, worked, uh, we partnered with the, um, uh, the Florida Public Archaeology Network's uh, CRYPT, which is the Cemetery Resource Protection Training. And in that, they uh, instruct communities on how to properly care for their cemetery markers uh, in a way uh, that is also safe for the environment as well as uh, the markers themselves. And so there are about 30 different um, community members between um, both Cosmo and Lone Star who participated. This was conducted at the community's um, uh, only really lasting um, cemetery, historic cemetery, uh, Palm Springs. Uh, and that was added to the National Register of Historic Places in 2020. And we just got word this past Monday that uh, they received a grant that will um, enable them to establish a, an official National Register marker. Um, what I really want to share here in closing is that uh, not only um, are, there, are we seeing many more um, opportunities develop for uh, preserving and promoting the, the culture, um, uh, even through the Commission's um, uh, Tourism uh, Alliance uh, that's connected uh, all along the uh, corridor, but also we're finding that students are interested in the culture. We attended um, an African-American uh, history writing um, kind of a, a competition, students developed curriculum on uh, various um, aspects of African-American history here in Jacksonville. And uh, one of those uh, was all about uh, the nature and the roots uh, of Gullah Kichi culture. So there are going to be 
um, continued um, opportunities to, to work together, collaborate with these descendant communities, uh, Cosmo and others, uh, to assist in uh, uh, continuing to promote uh, the, the Gullah Geechee culture and heritage. And I look forward to continue to work with that and of those communities. Uh, thank you very much. And we'll turn to Frederic. Frederic Mittner, FAICP, is the Historic Preservation Planner and CLG Coordinator for the City of West Palm Beach. Ms. Mittner has designated districts and sites on the local and national register, completed Section 106 reviews, and coordinated regulations for building size, scale, and mass, including intensive public outreach components. Ms. Mittner is a trainer with the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, past president of the Florida Trust for Historic Preservation, and member of the Palm Beach County Historic Resources Review Board. She enjoys working with property owners, architects, and developers to achieve viable preservation projects for commercial and residential uses. Welcome, Frederic. Thanks, Adrian. I appreciate you including me in this uh, great panel. And my focus is going to be on what we've done in West Palm Beach and a designation we uh, completed last year in 2021. And it is the known as the HG Roosters site at 823 Belvedere Road. So I'm going to just briefly share that story and hopefully uh, that will encourage other communities at the local preservation level at the regulatory aspect to uh, really look at their criteria and and um, <clears throat> open up some sites that maybe traditionally wouldn't have been designated. So we do have a major east-west uh, thoroughfare, uh, as you can see on the aerial there, Belvedere Road, and on it is the structure that if you saw it architecturally, probably wouldn't really meet the uh, level of integrity for um, the traditional architecture that we have in mind. Um, it was built in 1945, so it does meet at least that 50-year criteria, but um, it didn't really meet anything else except for its very, very important association with the LGBTQ community and the fact that it has been a safe space for gathering of members of the LGBTQ community and the philanthropy and the safe space that it has created throughout its a continued use as a gay bar. And so we were able to utilize our designation criteria, which are embedded in our local land development regulations, um, specifically A and B, A being the associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of our city's history and associated with lives of persons significant in the city's past. And so HG Roosters uh, being 50 years old and meeting those two criteria definitely met that it is significant for our community. And we did have the findings of fact by uh, both our Historic Preservation Board as well as our City Commission that, uh, again, it's 76 years old, associated with the development of West Palm Beach as a diverse community that we're very proud of. And it is the location of the oldest still operating gay bar in Palm Beach County, and again, associated with the safe community space. Um, so therefore, our Historic Board and our City Commission was able to designate it on our local register of historic places. Um, and we had really just some great support at these hearings uh, from members of the community. And um, the one thing, though, that has kind of come out of it, opportunities and challenges that I just want to present uh, and put out there for those listening, is that, of course, the design review process. Uh, we will not be regulating uh, much in terms of design review. Perhaps the elements that are important to us are the entry that's on the side, the high windows, and those were because of privacy. And originally, uh, when there was some altercations when the door was in the front, it was relocated towards the back for, again, that privacy. Um, and so those would be elements that are integral to the use, but we wouldn't be regulating paint color, which we don't anyway, uh, or any other architectural element. The other opportunity that has come um, upon us because of this designation is the ability to exempt some building codes. Uh, the site did uh, suffer from a fire and the owners want to rebuild uh, a significant portion of it and it would not have met some of our zoning criteria for landscaping and parking and other measurements and we are able to exempt some of those because our Historic Preservation Board also serves as our uh, zoning board 
of adjustments for historically designated structures. So uh, that's been an opportunity. Um, however, there's been challenges too. The challenges uh, with uh, the wonderful owners in terms of explaining what a historic designation means and that you'll still need to meet other code criteria. We can't exempt you from sprinklers and other life safety requirements. And so uh, just delineating what you know, a designation means and what benefits it comes with, um, and also explaining to other property owners why perhaps architecturally this use uh, or this site may not be regulated to the same level as theirs may be, um, and that the criteria are different. So those are some um, challenges that we do have with the site, but we're really happy to have added it to our local register, uh, making it our 47th individually designated site, and we're really open to uh, designating sites that really encompass our broader community. Thank you. Thank you, Frederic. And I believe we think that this is the first site in Florida that's been locally designated specifically for its context with the LGBTQ plus community. Is that correct? Right? That's my yes. That's my understanding as yeah. well. So. We're yeah, so hopefully it's the first of many, um, certainly a history that still needs to be explored in Florida a lot more. So thank you. You're a great You're example welcome. in West Palm. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> All right. So we will turn to our next speaker, Sarah Cody. Sarah Cody is the Historic Preservation Chief for Miami-Dade County. In this role, she administers the county's preservation program for 24 municipalities and our unincorporated communities. With a background in landscape architecture, Sarah aims to proactively protect the county's diverse resources through the lens of cultural landscape preservation. Given the expanse of physical jurisdiction here in Miami-Dade, Sarah's work touches on resources that exemplify the county's unique history and development, from its agricultural lands and early 20th century pioneer homes to segregation era motels and mid-century modern neighborhoods. She and her staff incorporate important community issues in the preservation work, such as equity and inclusion, affordable housing, and resiliency. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you for that intro, Adrian. Um, and as Adrian referenced our team at Miami-Dade County, she is a very integral member of our team at the county. Um, so thank you for you know, putting this together. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about diversity and inclusion in Miami-Dade County's historic preservation program. So when we talk about the history of formal historic preservation in the US, you know, most of the early grassroots preservation leaders were white women focusing on telling the stories of white male history. The majority of the historic preservation framework that we still use today was established before the Civil Rights Act, during Jim Crow era segregation, before movements for women and LGBTQ plus rights. And, you know, of course, I think as most of us know, this formal preservation movement is really not inclusionary of voices outside of a white privileged perspective and has largely ignored efforts of other communities. And the emphasis here on formal is really because, you know, this is what is traditionally recognized and taught as the history of the preservation movement in the U.S. Really, this is the story that we tell about historic preservation in the U.S., but like much of our work, it doesn't tell the full story. It excludes stories like Mary Burnett Talbert and the National Association of Colored Women who worked on saving the Frederick Douglass House and excludes other stories that have either been lost or have been purposely not highlighted. Um, you know, and those are the stories of communities trying to preserve themselves in the face of structural racism. And in um, the book edited by Erica Avrami, Social Inclusion and Historic Preservation, she says marginalized communities have always taken place-based collective action in resistance to state-backed oppression. But these efforts are largely not seen as preservation. They're not recognized as part of this formal historic preservation movement. And they're not recognized as people trying to preserve their communities. So now we have to ask ourselves, what should we be doing to proactively tell this fuller story? So let's look at a couple um, preservation stats real quick. Of the 95,000 sites on the National Register, only 8% focused on women or racial or ethnic minorities. And of that 8%, only 2% tell the stories of African-American sites. 
Um, less than 6% of the National Park Service employees are black and we have equally low representation in the fields of archaeology, architects and engineers, and professional preservationists. Um, data at the state and local levels really varies. It either doesn't exist or it's not easily accessible. So in our office, um, we did an audit in 2020 of the data that was available. So of the 1,844 National Register sites, only 4% deal with sites related to African American or Black history, 4% related to ethnic heritage, 1.5% related to women's history, and inconclusive data related to um, sites associated with LGBTQ plus history. When we look specifically at Miami-Dade County and our demographics, um, the 2019 demographic estimates show that our community is majority Hispanic or Latinx, it's 69.4%, uh, um, and then 16.7% African-American, 51% women, and 6.8% LGBTQ+. Now, when we did an audit on our own historic sites, um, and again, this was done in 2020, so we do have a few more designations since then that we'll be including when we update our audit. Um, but at the time, we had 188 designated sites. Um, we had 24, you know, close to 25% related to indigenous history. Um, so we're doing okay there. That's because we've always had a very robust archeological program at the county. Um, but you can see, for instance, if we look at that our community is almost 70% Latinx, we have 1% of our designations that address that history. So we're not doing a good job of representing our community. So what can we do about this? Um, and these are some of the things that we're focusing on in Miami-Dade to really center our preservation program in equity. Yeah. Um, we can broaden the concept of historic preservation beyond the building. We can proactively identify more diverse sites for potential listing or other preservation strategies aside from designation. Uh, evaluate and update existing designations to tell the fuller story of the sites prioritize future survey work for historically excluded sites and neighborhoods, conduct community outreach and engagement, encourage diverse board membership and staff, identify local partners that you can work on these initiatives with. We are very fortunate. We have a very active and engaged nonprofit in Miami County called Dade Heritage Trust, and we work with them a lot. And also ensure ongoing education around these issues for staff and board members. Another thing you can do is identify advantages in your ordinance. You just heard from Fred Reek that they use their ordinance to be able to designate the first site in the state related to LGBTQ plus history. So in Miami-Dade County, our ordinance is a really big advantage for us. We don't have a specific number of designation criteria that must be met. Oftentimes you see in local ordinances, you know, maybe you'll have seven criteria and the ordinance says, Oh, to be eligible, you have to meet three out of seven or two out of five or whatever. We have only, you only have to meet one criteria. And then on top of that, our very first criterion is incredibly broad. It says you have to be associated with distinctive elements of the cultural, social, political, economic, scientific, religious, prehistoric, paleontological, or architectural history that have contributed to the patterns of history in the community, the county, South Florida, the state, or the nation. So that's incredibly broad, and that's only one of our criterion. We also have flexibility with the age of a structure if there's exceptional importance. So we can designate sites that are less than 50 years old if our board determines that they are exceptionally important. And we do have a local circuit court case that gives us precedence to say that our board members have the expertise to define and find when a site is of exceptional importance. And we can also designate archeological zones and sites. So our ordinance in action, the Richmond Heights Historic District and the Liberty City Elks Lodge are two examples of recent designations based on cultural significance rather than architecture. And these are designated with notable differences in the way that we regulate these resources. And if you wanna hear in more detail about those differences in regulation and how we approach those designations, um, then look for another conference session titled, Do We Need Another Standard? And we'll be talking about those examples in more detail. So moving forward in Miami-Dade County, what are we trying to do? 
We do have a 10 year plan um, that really focuses on a lot of equity initiatives. We are currently undertaking a diverse heritage survey that is looking to identify neighborhoods facing planning challenges. So intense redevelopment pressures, gentrification, uh, climate gentrification, um, as well as resources related to our historically excluded communities. We're also including Indigenous heritage as a starting point for local designation reports. We're continuously identifying community outreach opportunities. We're conducting a lot of outreach to municipalities throughout the county and then also internally to county planning and development services staff. And we're making a lot more information accessible with an upcoming website update. So that is a very, very quick overview of some of the efforts that we're taking in Miami-Dade County to really focus on equity in our preservation work and look at preservation as a community issue beyond just the building. Um, and feel free to reach out to our office if you wanna discuss any of these initiatives or if you have any questions or anything. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you to your tiny assistant. Uh, that was a fun treat. Um, and thank you for the shout out too, as being part of the team. I, it's a privilege and an honor to work with you uh, in Miami-Dade County. It's really exciting to see all the initiatives we have going on. So happy to be a part of the team and thank you and your assistant. Um, and with that, we are going to turn to Sarah Miller. Sarah Miller is the Regional Director for the Northeast and East Central Centers of the Florida Public Archaeology Network, hosted by Flagler College in St. Augustine, Florida. She received her master's degree in anthropology from East Carolina University in 2001, where she developed archaeology education programs at Tryon Palace in New Bern, North Carolina. Upon graduation from ECU, Ms. Miller supervised field and lab projects with public involvement for the Kentucky Archaeological Survey, as well as reviews, reviewed compliance projects for the Kentucky Heritage Council. She currently serves on the board of directors as secretary for the Society for Historical Archaeology, chair of the Society for Historical Archaeology's Heritage at Risk Committee, chair of public outreach grant committee for the Southeastern Archaeological Society, statewide coordinator for project archaeology, and serves on the editorial board for the Journal of Archaeology and Education. Her specialties include historical archaeology, archaeological education, site stewardship, heritage at risk, advocacy, and historic cemeteries. Welcome, Sarah. I'm wonderful, Adrian. I'm really excited to be with you today and the other panelists and talking about something that means so much to us is diversity and inclusion. I am your archaeologist <laughs> here to talk about how we can expand opportunities for learning and for outreach um, on historic preservation in our communities. I work for the Florida Public Archaeology Network. In a nutshell, our unit exists to help protect the state's buried past through education and outreach. So that education and outreach piece is really important, but we also assist local governments, which is how I met Adrian and some of the other panelists, as well as assist our state's division of historical resources. Uh, some of the good things about archaeology is I feel like there's already an automatic community interest in archaeology, whether they're thinking of <clears throat> artifacts or ruins or things of the past. Archaeology is also a great way to look at people who are um, less documented than others in the historic record, and we can find evidence of people who are in places that maybe erasure was an issue or they wanted that part of their past to disappear. But luckily we can still go and take a look archeologically and find evidence of past cultures and do a lot of work today with living communities as well. So that could look like us doing, throwing atlatls with kids at schools, working with museums, making posters, making interpretive panels, doing 3D digital technology. Uh, it's, it's a really wide open field of doing outreach with the community. Um, on the left is an example of us doing our coastal walks and having community conversations about heritage at risk. So we have descendants, we have stakeholders, we have other people who are out on this lovely long walk with us to look at a site where people have lived for 6,000 years. The Menorcans, who are a minority group who were brought over as indentured servants, they have a 
uh, an area of the site where they lived. And also it was managed as a plantation. So there are about 90 enslaved people that lived on this peninsula. So being able to take a walk and see it's not just a site, it's not just a dot, it's a whole peninsula, a whole ecosystem that works together. Um, people are really interested in that and getting outdoors as well. And we are very committed to our work in public schools and public libraries. We had our group to wrap up with our summer library programs, and that's always important to get out into the communities and offer free activities for them to participate and learn more about their heritage. We're known for our cemetery resource protection training workshop. Uh, the theme of that is what can we do to make sure human burial sites stay in place for 100 years. So we're getting people together to talk about how to manage cemeteries, how to list a cemetery on the site file, which is very important for protecting it, the laws that apply to human burial sites, and also how to monitor them, how to keep an eye out for them year after year. Uh, other activities related to cemeteries, and I spend a lot of time on cemeteries because wherever there's people, there's dead people. So there's an opportunity everyone has to work with the community on historic cemeteries. There's right now a Florida Historic Cemetery inventory where people from the public can fill out a form or a postcard, let them know about a cemetery in their area, make sure it's got its dot so we can help preserve and keep an eye on it through the state's official inventory. And on the right, there's about 1,200 cemeteries in that map, but that's probably only a fraction of what cemeteries are really there in Florida. And when we go to these sites, we find a lot of these dots are not mapped in the right place and you can't manage what you don't know. So getting people out to these cemeteries, very engaging, very good for the sites and good for the communities to be aware and again, keep them there for another 100 years. Um, I have an article if anyone wants to reach out to me on the building blocks of that CRIP program. If you wanna replicate it in your state or your area you're working in, it's very adaptable. And uh, again, the community is very interested in these kind of opportunities. So getting them out there is great. You know, we often start in a community with cemeteries and then we'll extend to churches or community centers or other places that are important to them. We'll look on the site file and see that inequity that Sarah was just talking about. What do we need to go back in the site file and correct what sites are not there and then act adding this other layer of what's happening from climate change impacts and make that our priority to get those sites listed so they're also considered for protection. And one of the main problems again is that they're mapped or not in the right location. So that can be an easy fix if we can go out together and take a look at where they are and people generally really like site visits. I wanted to point out something in Florida that maybe didn't go as we hoped, but there was a lot of advocacy to get the Florida African American Burials Task Force started and the legislation was passed to convene the Burial Task Force and they have their final report that has great uh, recommendations on identification and protection, maintenance, memorialization, education. They filed a bill to have this uh, go further and that bill was not passed. But we can still be following these recommendations and it's true for cemeteries and for archaeologists. It's true for many other resource types that we can continue with those kind of recommendations. The other thing FPN is known for is our Heritage Monitoring Scout program. We just got done with a two-year study to look at a minimum of 500 sites across the state and assess the threats. Uh, we did this with 116 people, so much more than FPN staff and land managers, a lot of volunteers. We identified 13 new sites. We did updates to 94 sites, but we found that uh, climate change is surpassing development and impacts to the sites that we were looking at almost two to one. So um, we have more data on that uh, part of our poster and report. And finally, our People of Guana program we have now, and that's again looking more holistically at some of the land features and the communities. So our monitoring, you can see under the M monitoring is a part of it with the HMS Florida, but we wanna do some modeling. What's gonna happen to these areas? How do people need to be engaged and thinking about areas at risk, especially those that were erased and still need to be identified, meeting with the community and many stakeholders, and then doing some mitigation, doing that kind of 2.0 work of doing field schools or community digs and um, working these issues out. 
Uh, so finally, just further reading, if you're not familiar with the Society for Black Archaeology, I strongly encourage you to check out their website. Amazing members of African American and African descent all over the world, and you can just see the diversity of the projects they're working out. Of course, sites of enslavement are important to many archaeologists, but there is so much other history, so many other important sites, and I think they capture the breadth and width of um, that diversity and inclusion that we're hoping to promote. The Black Trowel Collaborative is a group that give micro grants for education and outreach generally. So you can visit their page and they have a lot of ideas funded for about $500 of uh, things you can do to get active in your community. And also keep a note on that National African Burial Bill. It's been circulating around, but really as preservation experts, we need to be available to our elected officials and let them know how important it is to have resources um, and network funding to help preserve those very special sites. So here's my contact information uh, at the Florida Public Archaeology Network and my Twitter handle, and you're welcome to contact me in any way for any of the information presented here. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. FPAN is always an amazing partner, especially with our local government preservation programs. Uh, there's so much we couldn't do without FPAN. And as a disclaimer, I'm on their board, so I have to be a cheerleader, but I would do it anyway. Um, it's, it's your fault that I'm into cemeteries <laughs> and climate change entirely. So we. Oh, well, uh, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not going to apologize for that. <laughs> um, no, we're so glad that you're involved. And and thank you to you and Dr. Brown. We had two archaeologists representing uh, the exciting work going on here in Florida, especially with African-American cemeteries. So thank you so much. And uh, with that, I will say a huge thank you to all of our panelists today and to the National Trust for having us as a part of the Pass Forward Conference. Um, I echo Reverend Cypress's invitation. We hope you'll come visit us in Miami and the greater state of Florida and explore our incredible historic, cultural, and environmental spaces and places. Thank you all for joining us today, and we hope the presentations have inspired you to look at preservation more broadly and inclusively in your community.